thanks to everybody who's joined here today to help us unpack this really important issue about how to make workplaces work for women and specifically work for mothers. This is everyone's issue. Today, there are 1.1 million fewer women in the workforce than there were at the start of the pandemic. And the fact that women still shoulder the majority of caregiving responsibilities is a huge factor underlying why women are being pushed out of the workforce. So Reshma Sujani's new book, Pay Up, The Future of Women in Work and Why It's Different Than You Think, lays out an action plan for how we can turn a crisis into an opportunity to fix the broken systems that never worked for women. So Reshma, in Pay Up, you write, when I wrote Brave Not Perfect, which was your first book, I was still in the throes of promoting the feminist propaganda of having it all via leaning in. Can you explain how and why this changed for you? Well, like I said, you know, I spent the past 10 years telling my girls to barnstorm the corner office, uh, to lean in real hard, to grow all the way to the top. And I learned the hard way that I was wrong. You know, I found myself in the middle of the pandemic with two little babies, you know, a a newborn and a six-year-old running a full-time organization, Girls Who Code, and it nearly broke me. And I learned that having it all is just a euphemism for doing it all. And for far too long, we've been trying to tell women to color code their calendar and get a mentor or be real brave. We've been trying to fix the woman instead of fixing the system. And the only way that we get to equality in the workplace is by fixing those structures, fixing those systems. And that also means getting to equality at home. Yeah, and it it seems like a really big issue. I'm just wondering in what other ways did the pandemic serve as a wake up call for you about the state of women in America right now? Well, I mean, I think it served as a wake up call for so many women and women of color that were always hanging, you know, by a balance that we, you know, for our entire work, we've been trying to hide our motherhood. Workplaces were never designed for us. You know, women were allowed to enter the workforce after World War II when men had to go to war and they needed us. And when they came back, they pushed us out. And everything about the way the workplace is designed, I mean, think about it. Workplaces are nine to five. School days are eight to three. Uh, They've basically been designed for a man who has somebody at home taking care of the kids. And in many ways, we've understood that. And, you know, so we always apologize for our motherhood. We don't show pictures of our kids at work. You know, when we have to go to a doctor's appointment, we say, I'm sorry. You know, we have constantly basically accepted the fact that we have two and a half jobs before we even start the work day. I think in many ways, what we saw during the pandemic and the school closures were a great example of this. You know, I keep thinking about this. Um, you know, for so many women that were pushed out of the workforce, it began with both with school closures. You know, at Girls Who Code, my entire leadership team were basically working women. And during those first months in March, April, May, I remember saying to us on the Zoom chat, just, we just got to hold on. We got to hold on. Whether it's that KPI or that project we have to launch or that big check that we have to go chase, we'll do that in September. Because in September, when the schools open, we'll be able to take a breath. And I remember in September, my son's in public school here in New York City, getting that note for the Department of Education saying, we've come up with this idea of you know, hybrid learning where you get to log on your kid at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, all the while you maintain your full-time job. And I remember naively thinking, Holly, like, wow, like, aren't they gonna ask us? Because here's the thing, policymakers knew, you know, in America, we do these time and use studies. So they knew who in March, April and May was doing the homeschooling. They knew that if they designed this entire system for tens of millions of children, who were gonna have to bear the brunt of the homeschooling and at what cost? And so I think so many of us were shocked, but then terrified that someone could make a decision that in an instant can change the consequences of our lives. And you know, again, the the second piece of this is that, and, and then they saw, the millions of women get pushed out of the workforce that December, you know, the jobs report came out. My friend Fatima Groves, you know, National Women's Law Center has been incredible at just documenting this in a wonderful report that came out today of just what is the impact, you know, on the pandemic, on job losses and for whom? And it's women of color that have borne the brunt. But still, even when that happens, it's there was no plan. 
there was no plan to figure out how are we going to get those women back. Mm. So we know that women of color, as you just mentioned, were pushed out of the workforce at higher rates. Can you just explain some of the factors that were driving that trend? Yeah. Well, first, I think many women of color have found themselves in jobs that weren't pandemic proof in retail, education, healthcare. And even now, two years later, there has been no national program to retrain many of these talented women, you know, whose the jobs that they're in just don't exist. And, and, and many of those women, we need to work uh, in order to put food on the table. You know, I think that the second part of this is that childcare has always been enormously expensive. Most Americans pay more for their childcare than they do for their mortgage. You know, the United States has the lowest amount of subsidies or support to families for childcare than in any other developed nation. And so if you're already a woman of color and you are underpaid, undervalued in jobs where you're barely hanging on and you basically spend most of your salary on childcare, in, day, in half of the daycare centers were shut down and schools are not open. Many women of color rely on uh, family members, you know, the, the aunties and the grandparents to take care of their children. They're not available because you're terrified that you're going to give them COVID. So we basically broke the entire structure of support for women of color. And still two years later, we have not fixed it. Yeah, it's been a very long time. Two years is a, a long time. And I mean, one stat that really floored me in your book was that working mothers today spend as much time with their children as stay at home mothers did in the 1970s. So this is not sustainable and it's obviously a recipe for burnout. How did we get here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's one of the things when writing this book, I really learned about, you know, how did it also break? It broke because we're in this era of intensive parenting, you know, where we have to teach our kids Mandarin, Hindi and Spanish, you know, by the time that they are six or seven. And we're also, because of technology as workers expected to be on all the time. And so that pressure that so many so many women feel and two thirds of the caregiving work is done by women so that pressure is being placed on women. And you know it, it's interesting I, I my, you know my parents were refugees and my dad's always like you know we you know we we I didn't even participate in any sports activities, nothing. I just followed them around and we went to whatever auntie's house that we were going to and we were in the basement watching TV and they were doing their thing like this whole era that we're in right now is crazy and but still we kind of and we push many families that don't have the resources to play along with it as well and so what's happened is it creates an enormous amount of anxiety and depression you know one of the things we're also really need to pay attention to is that america's mothers are broken you know you the 51 percent of working women are anxious and depressed and you know the CDC released a report that the two subgroups that are facing the most amount of mental health crisis post pandemic are 18 to 24 year olds and moms. And like moms don't break. You know, I was being interviewed by someone the other day and we were talking about this and he said, basically, you know, I, um, I was saying, you know, how moms don't break. He's like, you know, you're right. It's like, he's like, I was thinking about my mother. And you know, when my father died, I never even saw her cry. Wow. And so you see though so much trauma, so much emotion, the suicide rates you know, have gone up of mothers. And, and, and so it's just, and we don't have, you know, we don't have the Surgeon General report be like, hey, alerting everyone to that this trauma is existing. It's, and what's doubly painful is it's existing with our children and themselves. I mean, you have the highest rate of black girl suicides than you've had in the history of our nation. You know, and so imagine again, if you are a mother of color, how you're trying to reconcile what's happening with your child and then what's happening with you. And no one is acknowledging that something happened to you. You know, it's funny as I talk to women, especially in the past couple of weeks, as we seemingly are getting out of this, I think people are starting to feel the trauma now. It's hitting us of everything that we've kind of been through. And, you know, um, and, and this, this pressure of just like, well, everybody return back to the office. Like, let's let's go back. Is also just, I mean, not one memo, not one email of, how are you? I know we had another variant. I know 
your, your child care situation is probably screwed up, right? Because all of ours is with, again, daycare centers not being open, the government not passing the bill to basically relieve that, not increasing the salaries for child care workers who make less than zookeepers. Again, indication of how we value care in this society. And so, you know, not that acknowledgement, you know, not having that, not, I don't think we want to thank you, but I think many moms want an acknowledgement that something is happening. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it had to do with also, not only did we lose our formal support systems, but I relied so heavily on my friends, my sisters, my my mother. And during the pandemic, it's like, I think we all felt like we were in it alone. Like we were trying to juggle everything and balance everything alone. And I mean, so many of us were just exhausted during the pandemic, but we were way too exhausted to organize, but you got mad and you channeled that anger into writing the Marshall Plan for moms. So how how did you make that happen? Well, you know what? I mean, I, I think a lot of it had to do with my students. You know, I love my girls who code. And I've you know spent 10 years of my life making sure that they have every opportunity to march up into the middle class. And I started seeing, seeing during the pandemic year, a lot of my students falling out of either going to college or school because they were being saddled with having to do care work because their mothers were essential workers and they had to take care of their siblings. And so this two generational cycle of how we do this and that lack of acknowledgement that, you know, we love to go to other countries and tell them, well, girls shouldn't do care work, they should go to school. But when it's happening in our own country and it's happening to black and brown girls, it's just, and so the, the lack of care structure having such a massive impact on my community was, an eye opener for me. And then my experience again as a as a mother who is privileged. And you know, I kept thinking about my own mother a lot, you know, during my parents were refugees and you know, my, I was a latchkey kid from the time I was 7 years old and I grew up as, you know, a working class brown girl in a very kind of white working class neighborhood. And it was the 1980s post Vincent Chin and we weren't very welcome. You know, I was bullied at school, my parents were bullied. And, but my mom had to make that decision that at seven and 10, that my sister and I were gonna have to be latchkey kids. And my sister was telling me a story. She said, do you remember, remember I used to pick you up from middle school, used to grab your hand, and then we would run the 10 blocks home, terrified that someone was gonna hurt us because we've both been physically assaulted at that time because of the color of our skin. And we would go into our house, We'd lock the door and we would hide. And I think about how my mother felt every day at 345, thinking about her babies having to run home because she had no other choice. And the types of unconscionable choices that mothers are being forced to make every single day because childcare is either unavailable or unaffordable. And it pissed me off. And in and, and, and not just childcare, but not having paid leave, you know, the lack of flexibility, the fact that we don't have a, you know, a parental income in our country, but all, all the things. And it pissed me off that I feel like in many ways I've been lied to. And I've been lying to girls. I mean, I think about the fact, Holly, every day I get asked the question, well, Mr. Johnny, you know, like, and, and I would say, like, you know, when I was, you know, when I'm out there speaking and talking to young girls, you know, before I built the Marshall Plan for Moms, you know, I would get a question every time from a young student who would say, Mr. Johnny, Mr. Johnny, how do you balance being a mom and being a CEO? And I may have literally just come from the green room breastfeeding my child. And I would literally look at them and I would wave my hand. Don't worry about that. Just work hard. Just be brave. And the fact that I had bought into the big lie that it was that that it was about me and it wasn't about the system that there was nothing to fix in the system also pissed me off and made me feel like we just we got to change that and and that is kind of I think in many ways one of the radical things that I am trying to do in this moment is really kind of reframe what women's empowerment means today because we've been so conditioned. I mean, think about every book that we have access to, The Confidence Code, Lean In, right? It's all about fixing yourself, 
fixing you. We all think that there's something wrong with us. I'm not brave enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not confident enough. And it, we don't ever think, well, maybe they're just racist. You know what I mean, or sexist, or maybe they just are not helping me actually balance. I'm I'm fine. I, I'm I'm like smart. I, I got a degree. I got I got I, I'm crushing this. But we have literally brainwashed women to think that there's something wrong with us. So we don't focus on the things that we actually need to fix. And we got to, we got, and it is, it is a, it is a radical thing that we have to change. I mean, literally all the programming that women ERGs do, do all the programming that we do during women's history month or do during any moment is all about fixing women. And we also got to throw it in the garbage, even the language that we have, like think about imposter syndrome. You know, and where that comes from, right? It's it comes from us making women and people of color feel like there's something wrong with them, that they are not good enough, that they need to be fixed, that they need to work on themselves. And it again takes away from the fact that we have an incredibly fundamentally broken system that has never set you up to even have a chance at equality. We don't even have a chance at equality. Like it's almost a joke that like we don't we keep continuing this way, you know. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's why I love pay up. It it is a really comprehensive guide for solutions and you're all about solutions. And, um, I think that bringing people together and giving them a plan is, and creating this awareness, right? Because we're all in our own individual bubbles, but we don't realize how it plays into these larger systems. So, I know next we're going into our breakout rooms to talk about your plan, your four forces of change with our event ambassadors. But before we go, can you quickly give us an overview of this plan and the four forces of change? Yeah, I mean, so the first part of it is really about empowering ourselves and about not having and and really setting around setting boundaries. And so I didn't want to write a whole section about like, you should meditate more. You know what I mean? And like, take a night bath, take a bath at night and like go to yoga class. Like, it is really about like, what are the things that we can do to start setting these boundaries and start like, again, moving away from the sense that we have to be martyrs. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is this idea of like, and, and I know Eve's gonna talk about this with her book, Fair Play, but about like, I you know for me, my husband does the nights and I do the mornings. So if I'm sitting in an apartment chilling at six o'clock, you know, he's gonna be like, hey, can you warm up the, bo- you know, the bottle? Like, can you change the diaper? And I'll do it. Um, so at six o'clock I leave, I, you know, go do a girl's dinner. I, you know, take up, take a, go on a date with my dog, right? Like literally just leave. And so it's so important for us to kind of set these boundaries. You know, the second piece is like, again, you know, in the, why I think that this is a, I have so much hope is like in the middle of the great resignation, in the middle of the talent war, there are 11 million open jobs we have an enormous opportunity to finally make workplaces work for us and you're seeing this happen in salary you know there's an article out two days ago that said young women are making childless women are making more than men in 22 states because they're literally walking into those interviews saying i would like more here please and our version of that is like i would like you to pay for my child care i would like to have mandatory paid leave i would like flexibility and remote work I would like you to support. So there's nine things I talk about, about how workplaces can be redesigned for women. We're launching a national business childcare coalition that has, you know, is going bonkers because if there's ever been a moment to treat childcare like healthcare and make it an economic issue, you know, that is a benefit that companies have to offer, the time is now. You know, the third piece is really about um, valuing motherhood. You know, I I go to these, when I talk to these, I'm like, how many of us who have been pregnant have basically hit our pregnancy to the last possible moment? Like, that's just the price of being a mom. That we have worked in workplaces where we assume that they're going to discriminate against us. So we hide it. In fact, there's an article out about how Zoom's so great because you can hide your pregnancy till eight months. I mean, that's how far we've gone. And so we've got to change that. Society has to change that. We have to start valuing motherhood. We have to start parenting out loud. We have to stop apologizing for this. And I always say that my most important title is mom, mom, period. You know, and we have to, we have to create the culture and society. You know, one of the things people always say to me, Holly, is like, why Marshall Plan for Moms? And why not Marshall Plan for Parents? 
why not caretakers? And part of what I say, you know, it's funny, caretaking is not the problem, meaning in, culturally, like when we see Johnny walking his daughter to school, buying her a smoothie, we're like, God, you're such a great dad. When Johnny says, I got to leave a little early and take my daughter to the doctor's appointment, we say, go, Johnny, go. You're amazing. When Sally does the same thing, what do we do? We roll her eyes. She gets 40% of her salary taken away. So it's not the care work. It's who's doing the care work. It's why we have a motherhood penalty and a fatherhood premium. So we have to keep our eye on the fact of asking ourselves, why do we discriminate against mothers. Not just why do we not value care work? Why do we discriminate against mothers? And quite frankly, why do we not pay caretakers who are, for the vast majority, women for mm -hmm. doing that work? And keeping our focus on the cultural app is the only way we're going to fix it, from my perspective. And then finally, it's, you know, what so many, again, of the amazing women, you know, Fatima have been leading the charge on, like, how do we change government? You know, Again, going back to this issue, they bailed out airlines, but they did not bail out moms. You could not have had a better set of facts to ignite a sense of empathy and commitment from our nation to do what is right by its citizens. And we didn't do it. And they didn't do it. And so, you know, we have to ourselves keep pushing for these policies because we will win one mm -hmm. day. Um, we will but we have to keep fighting, keep pushing for paid leave, keep pushing for affordable child care, keep pushing for parental, child tax credit, keep pushing for our country and our government to value, you know, to value the work that we, the unpaid labor, quite frankly, that million, 40 million women do every mm -hmm. single day that sustains our country and our economy. Yeah, and, and you know, it is, it requires all of us banding together to really push for this and make our voices loud. And that's what we're going to talk about. So Reshma, I'm just wondering, how do you define power? Oh my gosh. Wow. Uh, no small questions here, huh? Well, first of all, <laughs> I, I want to express so much gratitude to Dr. Plummer and Eve and Rachel and Fatima. I mean, these are women that are just, God, I, I was like, I'm so glad to be sitting here listening to them and be, you know, in the grace of their presence of these amazing women who have just tirelessly been fighting for all the things that we have been talking about. And so many of them, I mean, Fatima and, and Eve, you've been so incredible in, in, in supporting this work and supporting my work and my leadership and being my, you know, my guides in, in many ways through this process. So I'm so grateful. And of course, unconsciously biased, Karen and Ash and you, Holly, like you are my family and I'm so grateful to be here. So what does power mean? I mean, I, I feel like power, I, I feel like there's no point of having power unless you lift others up. You know, I am a, I'm a pretty spiritual person, religious person. In, in Hinduism, they say, like, what do you put on this earth to do? And I very much feel like I was put on this earth to be a warrior. And mm -hmm. so much of my life has been directed in that path, even when I try to go into another path. And so power is about being able to really influence change for the most vulnerable which are women and girls, you know, in this moment. Your force of change is revised, which is all about shifting the narrative in our culture. You have said that our public, our private lives are public issues. And I just wanted to ask you, why do you think the home is the last frontier of feminism? Uh, because I think we've felt that the home is untouchable. Uh, we feel like because the home is a place of love, uh, it's a place where we can disconnect, that the idea of systems, of actually uh, trading assumptions for structured decision-making is something that is not thought of as something that happens in the home. Even my, as I said to you earlier, Holly, even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group has more clearly defined expectations in the home. If you don't bring snack twice to that group, you're out. Whereas, you know, one leader said to me, well, my home is where we wait to decide who's taking the dog out right when it's about to take a piss on the rug. So I said, whatever that is, fair play, uh, Marshall Plan for Moms, that it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It understands that we can't live in a figure it out world anymore. Because when you live in a figure it out world, what that really means is 
Well, if we don't have or decide in advance who is handling the unpaid labor in the home, then it's going to fall on women. And mm -hmm. I think that when you do add that up home by home by home, uh, we end up with $1.9 trillion of unpaid labor, uh, women's unpaid labor globally. $1.9 trillion. That, wow, that is a huge figure. Rachel, um, your force of change is educate. It focuses on reimagining the workplace. And we've talked about this before for some of the Forbes articles, but what are some of the most common biases that women face in the workplace based on your research at Lean In? Thanks, thanks for asking. That's such a good question. So I'm not going to tell anyone anything they don't know, but just zooming out for a minute, I think it's really helpful to just remember and put this in context that women do um, you know, half the world's work and we hold less than a third of the world's wealth. You know, we were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic where, you know, 50% of the workforce and yet less 70% of the jobs. And of course, Black women and Latinas and other women with traditionally marginalized identities were even more heavily impacted. We're still underpaid. We're still underrepresented. And we know the list goes on and on in terms of the way bias has a deep impact on our well-being, our financial well-being, um, our progression in organizations. I mean, women in the workplace, we look very carefully at, at, at some of those things, but we also look really deeply at the day-to-day -day experiences of work, which really matter as well. So a couple of things, you know, one, we know from last year that 42% of women said they were always or almost always burned out. Not just a little burned out, always or almost always burned out. And I think getting underneath these numbers, and this is not anything any of us don't know, but this is not because women are less resilient. This is because women are doing more, far more. So we know women have always done more in the home during the pandemic when all that extra work, all that extra childcare, all that extra housework, women took on five times more of that extra work on top of what they were already doing. We know that in the workplace, actually women showed up in the moment as better leaders, more committed leaders. Women took more steps to um, lift up other employees from a well-being standpoint. Women are more actively addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organizations, even outside of their everyday job. So it's a story of doing more at home and doing more at work right now. Um, so that was one big finding. The other thing is we know that women are often on the receiving end of bias, and that shows up in microaggressions, which I think need to be rebranded to just aggressions, because sometimes they're micro and sometimes they're actually macro aggressions. And so what does that look like? We know women are more likely to have our competence challenged, even in an area of expertise, we're more likely to be blamed for failure, get less credit for successes, spoken over in meetings. We all know a lot of this. We're also more likely to hear comments um, on our personal style. I'll just share one study because it makes your blood boil. Then in a study of performance reviews, 66% of women got something along the lines of they're a little abrasive or the way they show up with their team compared to only 1% of men. And then when you think about the experiences of women of color or other women with traditionally marginalized identities, um, on top of everything that women face because of their gender, they're on the receiving end of disrespectful and othering behavior. I'll just share a couple examples with you. You know, we know Latinas are three times more likely to hear surprise at their language skills or other abilities. Black women and Asian women are four times more likely to be mistaken for someone else. Gay and lesbian women are twice as likely as women overall to hear comments that are just insulting about their appearance. And why does this matter? There's a direct connection between microaggressions and bias back to burnout. We know that women who experience them are twice as likely to feel burned out. And also it matters because women are having a worse day-to-day -day experience. All of those aggressions add up. And that means women are less who experience microaggressions or are understandably less happy in their roles and more likely to leave their organizations. So in terms of, in, um, in addition to having all the right policies and programs in place, which are so critically important, we also need a call to action to change the culture of work. And that means all employees at all levels really need to be empowered to figure out how to show up and interrupt bias when they see it and beyond that, how to push and really show up day over day as true allies. So a big thing that we wanna talk about is how in addition to everything else, are we changing the culture of work? Mm, yeah, so women are really stepping up to be the DEI leaders in the workplace, and they're really stepping up in the home with the caregiving duties. So it makes sense that there is a greater rate of burnout. And, and thank you for sharing, you know, what needs to change. 
Um, doc, Dr. Plummer, so your force of change is empower. And just to be clear, women are not the problem. We're working in systems built on inequities, but how is taking care of your own mental health related to advancing equality for all? Absolutely. As I answered that, I was struck by something that you said a, a little bit ago, and I realized that there's such connection to the word empower and how I see myself in life and how I hope all of us see ourselves in terms of being trailblazers, right? Understanding that it, this conversation in itself is about breaking cycles, and we first have to break those cycles from within. When we're breaking in these cycles, it takes so much intentionality. It was intentional the way that these systems were created. It was intentional in the ways that we were left out of conversations. It was intentional in the differences of how we are paid. And like, uh, like the presenter talked about, even in the hours of work compared to the hours of school, right? All of that is intentional. And yet so many times we engage with these conversations or engage with our mental health in a very um, casual, or passive way, and it lacks that same level of intensity. When we are breaking cycles, it takes strength, it takes effort, it takes persistence, it takes perseverance, right? And so, yes, there's many times where we get overwhelmed by the responsibility that is placed on us to break these cycles, but there is no coincidence that we are created to be here on this earth at this time with the resources that we have, including the opportunity to lean in on each other. It's only been a couple generations in which we've started to see women in power. And sometimes we think about uh, how much progress has been made. Oh my goodness, we have a vice president who is a woman. Oh my goodness, we have the possibility of a Black woman as a Supreme Court justice. We've made so much progress, as opposed to, and not taken away from those beautiful women, as opposed to the idea of tokenism, right? To allow for us to be passive around other things. Here, we've given you a little bit here, so just carry on, right? Because isn't that how women have been socialized over years? We give you a little bit, now just go on and do what you were doing before. So to answer your question, Holly, because I get so excited, you know me, right? You know I get so excited about these things. The importance of taking care of our mental health, especially in these particular times, is because we are warriors, because this is a battle for equality. And when you are a warrior, your body is in use, right? And equally so, your mind has to have the same level of strength, the same level of tenacity, the same level of uh, Teflon, if you will, if we want to compare it to that. And you have to protect your mind also. And so you know when you're about to go into battle, I'm a veteran myself. So when you're going into battle, you're putting on your armor, you're putting on your the strength, you're putting on the things that protect yourself. And the same must be said for our mental health. What are our protective factors? What do we do before we go into a workplace that was not designed for us? What do we do when we go into a parent-teacher conference that's at one o'clock in the afternoon and they know that I have a meeting at 1.30, right? What do we do when we're trying to manage all of this? There is protective factors in terms of our emotional and our mental health as well. And so we have to empower ourselves by knowing what our protective factors is are, knowing what our coping mechanisms are, having a high level of intentionality when we are going into these places and not necessarily being defensive, but defensive, right? Because this is a war and we are breaking cycles and we are empowered to do this every day. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. So it's really a lot about working within and knowing, having self-awareness, understanding um, your boundaries and your non-negotiables, and then just being ready to stand up for those. That that was amazing. Thank you. Fatima, your force of change is advocate. What do you think are the most important public policies we need to pass right now to help support women and caregivers? The first is all of what we know about how women and moms in particular have experienced this pandemic is not by accident. It's because we are building on systems that were already pretty faulty. And what that means in practice is that we have to actually fix those faulty systems. We should see this period of time as the pandemic, as the light that has been shown on systems that weren't working for a very long time. 
And so that includes policies that are actually really on the table and ready to go to support women while they're pregnant, to support pregnant workers. For example, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act has passed in the House and in the Senate, it is bipartisan and so very close. This is a thing that can get over the finish line and make a difference. It means ensuring that when people have children that they have access to paid leave. And I know it has probably been frustrating watching the sausage making in Washington and seeing the conversation around paid leave wane. And what I am here to tell you is that the conversation amongst people who are fighting for paid leave has not ended. People are not deterred. They have not stopped. And policymakers need to know that that, that is the case too. And part of it is because of all of you and more have been amped up and understand that the brief moment where we actually put in a national paid leave program, it worked. The last two things I'm gonna say is we are not done around getting an investment in childcare. We have continued to lose childcare workers. And the reason is, is that the wages are so low. And as long as the wages are low, we are going to have a giant supply problem. And what that means that people have to understand is that childcare is the work that makes all other work possible. It is not possible to have a huge infrastructure plan that works and that has women going into those jobs if you don't also have a child care plan. And I think people are getting that. I have not given up hope. And then the thing that fewer people are talking about, but I expect to see a lot more about, is the lesson that we have learned around things like fair schedules, things like remote work. Things like having policies that make it possible for caregivers to shift how they do their work over time in a way that feels right and fair for them. There is a huge opportunity to change our laws and policies in this moment that will have real world and practical implications for all of them. So, so glad to be here and with all of you and let's get it done. One second. Yeah. And everyone, uh, the National Women's Law Center put out a powerful report. I just put it in the in the chat. Everyone, please read it and share it. Why? If you share one thing today, share this report, please. It's like it's critical that we keep educating and, and everything that they do on research is just fantastic and it's on point. And so share it, share it, share it. Thank you so much.